This video is a brief tutorial demonstrating how to go about conducting a formal and iconographic analysis of a Bosch painting. And not just any old Bosch painting, but his very enigmatic and very dense and complicated Garden of Earthly Delights. This piece consists of three panels. First, we have the Garden of Eden, which is this uh, left panel here. The central panel, which is the Garden of Earthly Delights. And then we have here on the far right, this is the Hell panel. And this is easily recognizable, I think, for its comparatively dark coloring with bits of menacing fiery flame throughout the uh, back areas of the composition. Now we can see that there is a lot going on here and uh, throughout the whole piece, all three panels. And you, know, you could write books and books on this wonderfully strange work of art, but we're gonna limit ourselves here. And we're just gonna do a very cursory investigation with just a tiny little section within this sea of imagery. So I chose to take a look at the central panel, the Garden of Earthly Delights, and you can see that this small area here, you can see it right here in detail. This is what I'm going to analyze. Here is a close-up. So we're gonna start out with a short formal analysis where I will identify what appear to be significant features of the composition and I will analyze them by moving through the three steps of formal analysis, which are identify, describe, and interpret. So let's start with the first step, identify. And this is a good opportunity for you to practice your developing skills in this arena. What I suggest you do is pull out your lecture notes um, and also your lecture or your notes on the Getty formal analysis or open up the Getty formal analysis webpage and pause this video and see what you can identify that may be of significance and I'll do the same and I'll meet you back here. So pause the video and then come back. Okay, so hopefully you did that. Hopefully you put together a list. I have two, and here's what I saw. So first of all, color. There's a lot going on here in terms of color. There are cool colors. You've got greens and you've got blues. There are also warm colors. We've got some reds and some oranges. And if you wanted to, you could even maybe craft a discussion on warm and cool colors. And you could talk about a warm, cool color contrast, uh, which we definitely have that going on here. Another thing that I saw were diagonal lines. Here's some here, diagonal lines here, slight diagonal line here, so diagonal lines. Scale, we have scale. That's a pretty interesting one where you have overly large fruit and birds, large in comparison to the people surrounding them. Lots of curved lines. Uh, more specifically, we call these curvilinear lines. And there also is some implied depth going on here. Now there's two types of implied depth and both types of implied depth are seen in this work of art. You have overlap, where you have um, overlap, right? Something that's covering up, overlapping something else. Or you have vertical placement where people or objects are higher vertically in the composition to suggest that they're going back into space, that they appear farther away. So I'm going to stop here and notice that with this step, that was all I did. All I did was identify. Don't go any further. Going further is for the next two steps, and you don't want to rush here. Go step by step. Go slowly to make sure that you don't miss anything and that you address each step thoroughly. Okay, so we're going to move on to the next step, which is describe. And here is where we're going to try to evaluate why Bosch made the choices that he made when putting together this work of art. What is he trying to say here? Now, before we go on, here's another chance for you to review. Take the list that I outlined in the previous slide and look up these formal elements and design principles in your notes and on the Getty website and note why each are significant and see if you can recognize these significant characteristics in this detail of the Bosch work that you see here. 
So pause the video, come back. So hopefully you did that. Now out of the five formal elements and design principles I listed, I am going to pick two to discuss further, scale and implied depth. Now let's start with implied depth. I'm gonna concentrate on overlap. You've got uh, this couple here overlapping, you've got this couple here overlapping, and the cutest owl of all time, and some overlap here with this man who's embracing it. So these are some examples of, of overlap. And what I'm gonna argue here, this is the described part, right? The significance, what this suggests, is that this is indicating closeness. Now then there's scale, and more specifically, this is hierarchical scale. And remember, hierarchical scale is where you have different sizes, and the object or the person that's larger indicates importance. So here, the birds and the fruit are of primary importance. Now, let's move on to the interpret step. This is where we suggest how implied depth and scale work to suggest meaning. So with closeness, it's making me think of sexy time. And I want to say that this is not because my mind is in the gutter, but because these people are naked and they are touching each other in ways that are seductive as well as affectionate. With scale, I'm going to say that the birds and the fruit, we, you know, we want to talk about why they're important, why they're significant, why they're larger in size, that they're going to indicate nature. And I'm going to take it a step further and say they indicate natural urges. And this is going to go along with this sexy time vibe here. So I would say that it was these natural urges that are strong, that are powerful, that strength and power indicated through the hierarchical scale that encourage these people to engage in these sort of sexually related shenanigans. Now, the other methodology that we're going to work with is iconography, the use of symbols. So I want to take a look at what symbolism is for the birds and for the fruit to see if I'm on the right track with this interpretation that I've been starting to suggest. Now, before we get into the symbols, I need to say a couple things here. First, I seriously cannot say this enough. You cannot make up your own symbolism. And you cannot assume that a symbol has a meaning similar to what we understand in our present day culture. Symbols are part of a long art historical tradition that developed over time. So you need to look them up. You've been provided with the resources to do this. You've got links to the online symbolism dictionary and to the dictionary of symbolism. Please use these sources and be sure to cite these sources in the text for whatever it is that you're writing. So, according to the Dictionary of Symbols, birds are representations of yearning lovers. And I know from my research that as far back as ancient Egypt, birds also represented lust and sexuality. And then according to the same source, the Dictionary of Symbols, fruit represents earthly desires. So for example, you have this group of people here that are eating all, all eating off what looks like a huge blackberry. So it's almost like this symbol of some sort of like orgy situation, even like back in here, it's kind of the same thing. And with the fruit being so large, it makes me think of like gorging or overindulgence. So perhaps this painting has a moralistic tone to it, especially because there does happen to be a hell panel right next to it. Now, one more word of caution about iconography. When you look up these um, symbols, what you're going to see is there's typically multiple meaning, symbolic meanings that are connected to these images. You're going to need to think critically about which meaning or meanings would be appropriate. So for example, let's say that you were going to look up the symbol of nudity. According to the online symbolism dictionary, the symbol for nudity is, this is I'm quoting here, it's the state of nature and innocence, unconcealed reality and pure truth. Yet in Christian symbolism, nudity marks original sin, the fall, humiliation, and spiritual poverty. It could portray virtue or shamelessness in various contexts. In dreams, nakedness reveals inhibitions, which are obstructing the dreamer's development. So, which one do you think out of all of this makes the most sense? 
Do these people seem like images of virtue and innocence? Um, looking at the overindulgence set suggested here, I would say probably not. So this would be an example of where you could make an error in your iconographic analysis if you said that this showed innocence, if it showed virtue, if it showed purity, because this is just like wanton sexual behavior um, implied, you know, right and left. So I think more likely what we're looking at is probably symbolic references to original sin, the fall, humiliation, spiritual poli spiritual poverty. And again, this is supported by the fact that the other two panels on either side are the Garden of Eden and hell. So this concludes our brief tutorial, shedding some light on this wonderfully weird and mysterious painting by the Northern Renaissance painter 